Hi, this is Ask GMBN Tech, our weekly show where you get to ask tech-related questions about mountain bikes, and we give you, well, hopefully we give you the answers that you need. If you want to ask any questions, get involved in the comments below. Make sure you use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech for any questions so we can easily pick those out. Or alternatively, you can email them to us at the email address just at the bottom of the screen right there. And it's hellotech at gmbn.com. Now, first up this week is from Ian Offen. He says, why do hardtail mountain bikes tend to have a through axle at the front, but a quick release out the rear? Um, when it's the rear end, it takes more impacts. I know riders like to take control of the front end, but every bike I've ever had, the rear axle, bearings, etc., goes first. It's the majority of my repair stroke expenditure. Okay, well, firstly, let's look at the suspension fork. So the suspension fork really relies on the axle as part of the structure. You've got the brace at the top, and technically, if you look at a mountain bike suspension fork compared to a motorbike fork, we're actually inverted. We call the motorbike design inverted, but that's arguably the right way, because that's how it was done the first time. So, the motorbike design has twin crowns, and it has the bigger part of the fork at the top, the smaller part at the bottom, and it's clamped together. But because of the size of the motorbike fork and the material that's used in them, they can make those clamps industrially sized to avoid flex. Whereas if you did that same design on a mountain bike, and some brands have done this, if you look on screen, you can see a Manitou Dorado, you can also see a Marzocchi Shiva, and also a nice shiny new single crown fork called the Intend. These forks are all fantastic, but they're never gonna be quite as stiff as the other way up, which is what we know as the conventional design. Now, way back when everyone was running quick releases, this was the weak point in a suspension fork. Now you have the brace that helps add a bit of torsional stiffness between those two legs, but really it's the axle that does everything. So it's really, really important to have that up front. And now it's universally known as the best way. And you even see this taken across onto rigid forks and onto road bikes and gravel bikes now. And the system now effectively is like an oversized quick release. It works on the same principle. It will screw in to the actual fork itself and will have a cam operated lever. Of course, there are some easy options that just have an Allen key head on. But out back on the bike, you think the bike frame, in particular on a hardtail, it's a structure, it's built as a thing. The wheel simply sits in there and a quick release is there to hold the wheel into it. It's not there to do anything as such with the frame rigidity. It's a little bit different on suspension bikes because again, it can be used for that. And most suspension bikes these days are warm into the idea of using or certainly have already been using some sort of bolt through or a quick release type bolt through rear end on them. Now the reason you're getting more problems on the back of the bike isn't, I don't think, because it's got quick release. I believe it's just because the rear ends of most bikes take the most amount of abuse. Now, if you ride flat pedals, even more abuse out back, but we'll get to that one in another question another time. The whole point I'm saying is your body weight is based around the back of the bike. When you're descending and going flat out, the suspension fork up front takes that shock, but the, truck, the shock still has to go somewhere and it's gonna hit the back end. The majority of weight is on the back of the bike. And then of course, there's what the transmission does. All of that torque, pulling and twisting through everything. So if you think, if you do have a bolt through on the back, you could arguably save yourself some maintenance that might occur from the twisting of parts of the frame that are gonna prematurely wear bearings. But really, it's just the whole thing is gonna take that sort of abuse. And really, that's why you're getting that. Now, regular maintenance is obviously gonna help here. If you're riding with any bearings that are slightly knocking, slightly loose, they will certainly get substantially worse by the end of the ride because all of that driving force, your body weight, the torque from the pedaling, all of that stuff going through that back end, it's just gonna mash those bearings to pulp. So just keep an eye on your bearings, make sure you do some overhauls. And in fact, I think I should probably do a hub overhaul video on GMBN Tech soon just to make sure everyone's topped up on that because it's, it's an important one to do and something that people overlook quite frequently. All right, next up is from Mudkip Man. Um, I've just got the new Nupru Scout with a Brand X Ascend dropper post and it came feeling pretty gritty and it had to be pulled apart by hand to the upper position. Uh, the stanchion was not scratched thankfully. My dad recommended using some Vaseline under the seal and now it works magic. But is it harmful to the dropper or any other suspension components? And what might have been wrong with my dropper post in the first place? More importantly, can I just use Vaseline as suspension grease? Well, okay, first up, um, your dad did absolutely the right thing in taking the seal back and putting some grease under there in the first place, even if it was Vaseline, um, because you think in a manufacturing process, thousands and thousands of components like that go through. At some point, 
the grease pot is going to run out. So it just sounds that your particular seat post has been unlucky. I've ridden those before and the ones I've ridden have been absolutely fine. So I'm convinced you just had a bit of an anomaly, but thankfully it wasn't scratched and it sounds like it's working great now. Uh, just make sure you keep on top of that because just with the nature of a suspension fork going up and down, when your dropper post goes up and down, it can ingest mud and muck under that seal, which of course dries out the grease that's under there and it can lead to scratches on that stanchion post or stanchion tube. So yeah, keep doing exactly that and it will stay working. Okay, so Vaseline as a suspension grease. Right, so what do we know about Vaseline? Well, the first thing a lot of us will have learned at school is Vaseline shouldn't be put near anything rubber. Um, use your imagination for that one. However, it's a little bit different in the terms of suspension components because Vaseline isn't that harmful to, type, to the types of O-rings and things that are used within suspension components. And in fact, some dedicated suspension manufacturers that make their own greases, there's a lot out there, there's Buzzies, there's Slick Oleum, there's RockShox uh, butter or um, SRAM butter that's available. There's loads of options on the market and a lot of those do have petroleum in them. So I looked into this in a bit more detail just to confirm my suspicions and you guessed it, they pretty much all have petroleum of some kind in them. Now I was looking into this because I know that Slick Oleum make greases for other manufacturers but they don't specify what ingredients are in their actual grease. Now you look on the safety data sheet, you'll see that their, uh, their concoction, if you want to call it that, is a, a trade secret. They don't want to announce what's in it. So I looked into Buzzy's grease, which we know is made by Slick Oleum, and you guessed it, on their safety data sheet, it actually gives away that there is, it's a petroleum basis to their grease. Now this is the same with SRAM butter, which is made by Maxima Lubricants. Again, it's a petroleum based grease, so all of them all the suspension based greases out there really are designed for use on those sort of seals against bushings, O-rings, all that sort of stuff and they're perfectly safe. But there are a lot of differences between Vaseline and dedicated suspension greases. Now Vaseline of course is going to be far thinner and it's actually going to just disintegrate a lot quicker than a dedicated grease. It's designed, the dedicated grease is designed to stay, they're designed for that job and yes okay they're a bit more expensive but that's what you're paying for, a dedicated product. At the same time, smart move on your dad's part for knowing that the Vaseline would be fine there. Just make sure if you're gonna continue using that, use more of it more regularly because it will dry up in time and you wanna monitor that it doesn't damage any of your suspension components or dropper post components. Next one's for the tall people. So this one's from Robert Pike. Doddy, a tip for tall riders please. I'm just over six foot two, got long legs and I ride an extra large size 29er hardtail. My seat is set perfectly height-wise, but it's really high compared to my bars. I want to shorten my stock stem, which is really long, and raise my handlebar height to take some weight off my hands and relieve some of that pain on my hands and wrists. Can you tell me again what size stem you use, um, as I've got pretty straight handlebars, and tell me about the rise you have on your handlebars. Uh, fingers crossed that all makes sense. So on my Mega, which is a size extra large, I'm just over 6'3", so we're very similar in height. Uh, it came with a 50mm stem, but I actually found it a little too long for me. So I've got long arms and a bit of a shorter trunk. Hence, I always go for a shorter stem and a wider bar. That suits me, it might not suit you. It does vary. Um, so I've got a 38mm rise bar and a 35mm stem. And on that particular bike, because it's exceptionally long, I've got, I think, three or four spaces under the stem. Now normally I wouldn't have a front end that high, like on my new Canyon Euro and the front end's quite a lot lower. The bike's a bit shorter, so um, I like to have a bit more weight onto the front tire there for loading it, whereas on the longer Mega, I feel like I need to be in the middle of the bike a bit more because it's such a long bike. Now you need to experiment with this stuff and I would say do one by one. Uh, with the stem, so let's say you've said a long stem, you haven't said how long. If it's 80 millimeters, I probably wouldn't go any shorter than 60 because you're changing extremes of a bike here. And by, if you change nothing else, you just change one of these things, like the length of the stem, it's gonna bring you bolt upright. You'll feel like you have to put your saddle back on the rails. And then when you're climbing, you'll have too much weight on the back end of the bike and not enough on the front, so it will wander around. But you could, for example, have a shorter stem, so go for a 60, and then a wider bar. So although your position comes back, your shoulders will come forwards again as your handlebars come out slightly. They're all directly related. 
Now make sure you do play around with these things and if possible, ask a friend if they've got, I'm sure between your riding groups, someone's got like a slightly longer stem they might not be using anymore that you could just try for size or failing that, someone will be able to help you and try a few options on stem spaces for height. Also bear in mind the higher your stem goes, effectively the shorter your top tube gets because you're bringing it back. If you've got a bike that's got a slack head angle, it will get even shorter, even quicker. Of course, you have to come up quite a way for it to make a massive difference, but we're talking five, 10 millimeters here. It does make a difference in the grand scheme of things. The best thing to do is experiment with it. And in fact, you've given me an idea of, I'm gonna make a GMBN Tech video on the effects that these sort of things make. I'm just gonna accentuate it out on the trail. Um, but in the meantime, good luck, and I hope you find what sort of setup suits you. Ooh, tricky one from Justin was in Buffalo. Uh, Dottie, got a good question. I've got a 2018 Canyon Strive and I have the RockShox Monarch Plus R on it, but I want to install a Fox DPX2 upgrade. Do I need to install it upside down? Love the show, by the way. Been here to the beginning and really appreciate your input. Uh, thanks, Justin. Appreciate that. Um, I actually had to look at this just to check because um, it's very unusual for a bike like that to have the shock upside down when it's clearly a lot of room in the frame. There's no obvious reason. And I think you do have to run this upside down because of the fact that the top of the DPX2 shock, if you were to run it the correct way up with the piggyback at the shock and the adjusters at the top there, essentially the shape shifter system where the top shock mount is, I think it fouls it very slightly when the whole system moves, either under compression or when the shape shifter brings it back in and under compression. I don't think it's actually compatible that way, which is why Canyon spec it upside down. A little bit annoying, granted, because of the fact that uh, your access to the climb switch, if that particular model has the climb switch on it, uh, means it's further down. But the thing that you'll probably know that I've discovered is on the Strive, when you actually put it in uphill mode, actually the climb switch is less relevant because of the position you are in on the bike. Um, it's up to you though, the DPX2 is a very fine shock, it just does mean you'll need to run upside down. But you could run it with a lockout and have the lockout remote in the bars. Uh, that would mean having a lot of remotes on your bars though, which would be unfortunate. All right, next one is a shock related question from Aaron Ashmole. Hi Doddy, I've got a Fox Float CTD shock. Can I run it in trail mode on less bumpy descents or will it still damage it? Um, no, it'll be absolutely fine. So the CTD stands for Climb, Trail and Descend. So the trail basically means you can use it when you're out on the trail. The idea from Fox was you use it on the more undulating terrain and you have it in descend for those flat out bits when there's no sort of chance you're gonna pedal, it's all about the descending, i.e. the shock's gonna be completely open. And then you can flick it onto the climb mode when you're going back up that climb to get to the top and basically your bike's just gonna react a lot less. Now you're not gonna damage anything by running in this, so don't worry about that. I'm just gonna to explain to you a little bit about how the system works. So you've got the dial on the top here with the lever, a three position lever. Uh, this one actually doesn't have three positions because the way it's been cut away. This drives a cam at the top. And then there's a little pin, like a shaft, that goes all the way down here. And you can just about see here some shims. Basically, in with this, you have three different positions allowing different amounts of oil to flow through with different amounts of resistance to go through that circuit that's built on the inside here. Now by closing that, you're effectively stopping the oil come through there, which means it's effectively locked out. However, in a big impact, the shims will simply move and allow the oil to pass. So you're not gonna damage anything. In time, if you were to run it, let's say for example, in a fully locked out mode, and you ran it in that all the time, and you're going out, you're jumping off flights of stairs and doing that sort of stuff, you can basically get an oil leak on the inside, you can damage the oil seals, and you can probably just bend those shims a little bit um, just through misuse, but it's no biggie because the shims don't cost a lot, and at the end of the day, you'll be looking at a service. It's nothing crazy, so don't worry about it. Continue using your lockout lever for exactly what you're using it for. You will not damage it. Our last one is from Harvey Lakey. Uh, I've got a 2018 Specialized Pitch Comp 27.5 Hardtail. The drivetrain is Shimano Asira rear derailleur and Altus front derailleur. It's a 3x9 cassette. Now I've been wondering, is it worth converting it to 1x10, 1x11 or 1x12, as I'm jealous of my dad, his mates and friends. Uh, the area I ride is not very flat and the hills are quite common, so I need a really big and a really little gear. Um, yeah, okay, so, well firstly, try not to be jealous of anyone else's 
bikes and their gear. Just love your own bike, get to, get to know it and get, get riding it. Basically, you will toughen to it, you will be able to ride anything on it, regardless of however many or however few gears you have. That said, if you wanna upgrade, yes, of course you can do this, but it will cost you money to do it. So my recommendation, firstly, is wear out that transmission that's already on your bike. If you were to take it off now and sell it, you wouldn't get that much money for it, so you may as well use it to the best. So ride it until it's worn out. I'd recommend you get yourself a chain checker because then you can monitor the wear on it. And then when it's finally worn out, then hopefully at that point you'll have saved up enough money to get yourself a one by transmission. Now I don't think you need to go as hard as going for a one by 12 and it will cost you more by doing that. I reckon you'd be quite fine going for a one by 11 or a one by 10. Um, it's no problem, you'll need a cassette. You might possibly, you say you've got a three by nine, as you see, you could go one by 10 on there, um, on yours, no problem. Uh, you might need a different rear hub if you want to go any bigger because the free hub body itself is slightly wider. That's when it starts costing money. So back to my original point is start saving now and just get on with your riding for the time being. Don't worry too much about them. In fact, just get really fit and absolutely destroy them on those climbs. And in doing so, you're going to wear out your transmission anyway, which means hopefully at that point you'll have enough money, you could upgrade your wheels. At the same time, get yourself a new chain, a new cassette, a rear derailleur, and then you can just go one by on your existing cranks at the front. Nice and simple. And there we go, there's another weekly Ask JBN Tech in the back. If you have any questions, let us know in those comments or hit us up an email at hellotech at gmbn.com. And for a couple of videos, if you want to see that brand new 29er yt 2 s downhill bike, click right down there. And if you want to learn a bit more about body position, particularly helpful if you're super tall or super short and you're a mountain biker, click down here. As always, give us a huge thumbs up if you love what we do here at GMBN Tech. And don't forget to click and subscribe and share our content. Cheers, guys.